obtained without lawyers and with findings of probable cause to believe that they committed the crime. Today's guest, Georgetown professors, Wally, Wallace um, Malinick and Eduardo, <laughs> and Eduardo Ferrar's presentation will focus on this national scandal and discuss the changes being instituted in the DC juvenile court to recognize the so -so, so psychosocial condition of adolescence and reinstitute a more rehabilitative juvenile court. Professor Malenik is the former director of Georgetown's Juvenile Justice Clinic. He served in that position from 1973 to 2015. He was the associate dean for Georgetown University's clinical programs from 1986 through 2005. He also teaches courses in wrongful convictions, children's rights, and assists in training fellows in the Prettyman Fellowship Program. He is the author of numerous books and articles concerning criminal law and the law relating to children and families, and has written and spoken extensively about the clinical education and critical pedagogy. Clinical pedagogy. He received his BS at Northwestern University and a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Prof Professor Eduardo Eddie Ferrar is legal and policy director, as well as a founding member and former executive director of the organization. Professor Farrar also serves as the chair of the board of directors of the Campaign for Youth Justice and the chair of the board of trustees of the Next Step Charter School in Columbia Heights. Professor Farrar received his BS in business administration from the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University in 2002 and his law degree from Georgetown Law in 2005. Thank you all for coming and help me welcome our guest speakers. Hi, so uh, you know a little bit about us, but uh, let me just ask how many of you in this room are in law school? How many of you in this room, that's interesting, how many of you in this room want to go to law school? How many of you want to be public defenders in the traditional sense, doing criminal justice work? So those of you who do not want to do the public defender work, do you want to do children's work generally? Is that why you're here? Just trying to figure out uh, who's in the audience. Um, Eddie and I uh, work, uh, as you heard, at Georgetown. Let me just say a couple of words about that. Uh, you may or may not uh, remember or realize, I, I would probably be the only one old enough to remember, that in 1967, the Supreme Court decided a case of in Ray Gerald Galt. That was the first time the Supreme Court addressed the issue of what kinds of due process rights uh, children should have when they're brought into court. Uh, specifically, the court said that uh, the Constitution is not for adults alone. They said that if a child has been arrested, he should have due process, specifically notice of charges, uh, counsel uh, at uh, the stages of the proceeding, uh, the right, uh, the privilege against self-incrimination, and the right to confront and uh, cross-examine witnesses. Galt was a huge case. Almost every state, probably every state, uh, revised its statutes after the Galt decision. But Galt was also narrow because it only addressed the trial stages. It didn't address pretrial issues. It didn't address uh, uh, sentencing issues. A little bit, uh, bit of word. That's sort of the background to where we're going to go. Uh, just a word about the Juvenile Justice Clinic. We were founded uh, very shortly after Galt. Uh, Galt was 67, the clinic was founded in 73. Uh, we were founded, uh, number one, to provide representation to children coming through the DC courts, but number two, to begin to develop a cadre of lawyers who would go out and become public defenders for children. There were very, very few at the time. Uh, there are many now, but as you will learn in other sources, not today, that the resources that we have for those uh, lawyers is minimal in most states. Uh, it's hard to make a living uh, in the state of Virginia, for example, if you want to be a public defender because they pay very, very little for that work. In 2016, we expanded our work into policy work and, and sort of evolved into the Juvenile Justice Initiative. Eduardo has sort of driven that uh, part of our program for us and has been responsible, I think, responsible for a lot of the changes in D.C. So let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about. Uh, if you look at the history of crime in the United States, we've always had crime. 
But the numbers of detained in, uh, and con uh, uh, committed youth uh, nationwide is, uh, is pretty appalling. Um, we call it the Dickinson Dickinsonian uh, bureaucratic machine because as you can see from the slide, every day 25,000 youth are held in some form of secure detention. Another 65,000 are held uh, in other forms of secure placements or residential treatment centers. And what makes these numbers so staggering is that there's been a decline uh, in arrests of juveniles uh, by 33% in the last 10 years. Right now in the District of Columbia, how many people here think that the District of Columbia has a major crime problem? Oh, come on. Aren't you reading the newspapers? Well, here's the truth. Crime in the District of Columbia today, both adult crime and juvenile crime, is lower than it was when Richard Nixon was the President of the United States. If you read newspapers, crime seems to be going like this. If you look at the numbers, crime is going down. While that number itself is sort of an embarrassment, this number of the people going into detention, when we begin to look at the discriminatory effect of who this is actually a, a, a as a, where the greatest uh, effect is, you see that it is scandalous. African American youth, four times more likely to be placed in secure detention. Uh, in six states, that increases tenfold. So an uh, African American kid has a 10 times greater chance of being locked up than a white kid. Hispanic youth, 60% more likely to be put in placement than their white peers. American Indian youth, nearly four times as likely as white kids to be locked up. We know that why this happens. This happens because of both explicit and implicit bias in the juvenile court system. At every stage of the process, from mere contact on the street, arrest by the police, detention by the judge uh, prior to hearing, findings of guilt, and draconian sentencing, we know that African American and other children uh, of color are treated worse than white kids. We also know, as we read the literature and study the numbers, that this mass incarceration has essentially replaced Jim Crow as the new way to get control of minority children. So what happens, uh, uh, how does a kid get locked up uh, without, uh, without probable cause, without having anyone make a determination that this kid really did at least likely commit this kind of a crime? So as I said when we began, the Galt decision did not uh, deal with uh, what happens prior to trial. If you're an adult, you cannot be held for more than 48 hours without a judicial determination that there was at least some probability that you uh, committed this crime. If the police cannot show that within 48 hours, you actually have to be released. The case can still proceed on to trial, but they cannot held you, hold you in secure detention. It's not quite so clear uh, about this law uh, as it applies to children. A lot of people will say, well, it's unconstitutional to hold children when we're uh, not holding adults. But in fact, the Supreme Court has, say, has said there is a difference between adults and children, and the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution doesn't apply to children the same way it applies to adults. There was another case in the Supreme Court called Shaw versus Martin, Martin where the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Rehnquist wrote uh, one of the more damaging but somewhat accurate statements when it comes to treating children fairly. And in that case, he said, children are always in some form of custody. Unlike adults who have the freedom to walk the streets generally, children are always in the custody of their parents, they're always in the custody of their school teachers, and so it's no big deal if they're in the custody of the juvenile justice system. Few states have adopted the adult rule for children. The District of Columbia is one of them. We have to have a probable cause hearing within 24 hours, right, except on weekend, within 24 hours, where the police have to come in and actually testify that this is what the witnesses said happened, and this is the person the witnesses said did it. Doesn't mean you're guilty at that point. You don't have the full play of cross-examination and everything else going on. But at least we know there are some witnesses out there who say this is the person who committed the crime. That does not happen in every state. 
In fact, it happens in very few states. And because of Shaw, the Constitution does not mandate uh, equal treatment for children and, and adults. So what happens when they get there? <clears throat> well, 10% of the youth who are incarcerated in state facilities are sexually abused by staff and fellow inmates. 25% under 13 suffer some form of violence while in state custody, again, either by staff or other inmates. 11 injuries to youth per 1,000 youth, uh, youth nights uh, in the District of Columbia facilities. 20.6% of gay or bisexual boys face sexual assault. Psychological harms exacerbate the existing trauma. 90% of detained youth have some prior exposure to trauma. Suicide rates in an institution are seven times higher than they are for a kid on the street. So let me go back again. The juvenile system, both before Galt and after Galt, uh, was based on a rehabilitative system. That is, we don't take custody of children unless we intend to rehabilitate them. This is what rehabilitation looks like in the juvenile court. The so-called rehabilitation system doesn't help them inside, but it also fails them on the outside. So what happens when these kids actually get released? It isn't that they've been rehabilitated. Uh, most serious offenders, for example, demonstrate uh, actually low or zero involvement with criminal activity actually after they get out of uh, a facility. I mean, after they get out of, out of juvenile court. The majority of serious offenders are not necessarily bad actors who are destined uh, for adult criminal activity. Uh, the most obvious case is drug offenses. If you do self-reporting studies of drug offenses amongst adolescents, white children and African-American children use drugs at the exact same rate. There is no difference. And yet we know from those other statistics that all those African-American and Hispanic kids are being locked up. The white kids are not. Are they becoming criminals? Of course not. Adolescence is a time of experimentation. They grow out of crime. We all grow out of crime. I was locked up in seventh grade. Here I am, right? So it doesn't happen to everybody. We also know that incarceration and facility in treatment facilities has the potential to increase recidivism. A study of 30,000 kids in Chicago found that detention increased the likelihood of adult incarceration by 23%, which means if we hadn't locked them up, it's a good chance they wouldn't have committed those crimes. It decreases high school graduation by 13%. So this is what happens to kids today. And it begins primarily in that pretrial stage because a kid who is locked up pretrial is more likely to be found guilty, whether he is or not. We all know that there are a lot of people who go to jail who haven't committed and if they are found guilty, they are more likely to be locked up as a sentencing option than placed on probation. Interestingly enough, the District of Columbia is generally thought of as a, a very poorly run city by a lot of people. I think that's because mostly we think about the Department of Transportation trying to get a driver's license, trying to get our water bill straight. All that seems to be a disaster in the district. My friend Michael here has been fighting his water bill for a year, I think. But in fact, the District of Columbia has actually become somewhat of a model for some of the processes uh, uh, by which children are treated in the district. It was an early adherent to the due process model. We actually uh, have uh, rules in our court since 1971 that resemble adult rules pretty carefully, slightly different in sentencing options, but things are changing in DC. As I said earlier, Eduardo's been very instrumental in getting those laws changed. We actually, actually also have a very, very good attorney general. I never thought I'd ever say something nice about a prosecutor. We have an extremely good attorney general right now in Carl Racine, who has really changed the culture of the entire prosecution office. So I'm gonna let Eduardo tell you about the things that are going on in DC. We're going to talk for maybe another 20 minutes and then open it up to questions for the rest of you. Thank you.
so it's only something that um, a young person could be arrested for. Not going to school, running away from home, not obeying your parents, those are status offenses. And so prior to the change in the law, if you fit one of these two categories, and a judge found that it was necessary, that detention was necessary to protect the person or property of others or of the child, or to secure the kid's presence at the next court hearing, then you could be detained, okay? The result was most detentions were justified by it being necessary to protect the child. A young person was smoking pot, he won't smoke pot anymore in detention. We're gonna detain him. A young person wasn't going to school, well, we have a really bad school in the facility, but it will ensure that they're going to school, so we're gonna detain them. They're not making it home for curfew on time, we'll know where they are when they're in detention. And so this justification was drawn up that when a kid is not paying attention to our court orders, we will detain them for their own good, for their own protection. And as a result, we had, despite a huge decrease over the last 10 years in the number of arrests, we saw very little to no movement in the number of kids being detained before trial. And so what we did is we changed the law. We made three big changes to reduce the number of kids in detention. First is we outlawed the use of detention for kids who were charged merely with status offenses. So if you haven't committed a crime, you can no longer be detained in the District of Columbia, securely detained in the District of Columbia, okay? So that was number one. Number two was we said, no more can you detain a kid for their own protection. If the kid really needs to be protected, there are better ways to do this. If the young person is legitimately a risk to themselves, then there are m medical interventions that can be taken. If it's just that we're frustrated with them and that they're not dangerous, they can no longer be detained. And to make sure that that got taken seriously, we also increased the burden of proof. So it's no longer to protect the person or property of others, but it's to protect the person or property of others from significant harm. So what was also happening was essentially, folks were trying to find pretexts for detaining young people. So if I can't detain them anymore because they're not a danger, or because I can't detain them anymore for being a danger to themselves or for violating conditions, then I'm gonna detain them under the pretext that they're a danger to others. They're not coming home for a night of curfew. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're out committing new crimes, right? So increasing the burden of proof helped also make sure that this new law was taken seriously. So what has happened as a result of these changes? You'll see here that this is essentially the monthly average for the last uh, about seven or eight years of detention at our facility, which is called the Youth Services Center. So if you look, it's an 88 bed facility, which means right at about here is capacity. This line here is the effective date of the new law. So prior to the new law taking effect, despite the decrease in arrests of young people, you saw that for the most part of the five or six years preceding the new law taking effect, the facility was over capacity. I think the highest I saw it got was about 150 kids. So almost twice as many kids in the facility that there should have been, or that they had the capacity for. Kids were sleeping on cots and hallways. They were sleeping in the gym. Fights were out of control because there wasn't enough staff to adequately supervise kids and they were literally on top of each other. Rec time was decreased because there were so many kids. School was decreased because there were so many kids. Right? And this is what was happening in the context of decreasing crime rates in the District of Columbia. In 2017, April, we passed the new law. And what you've seen is a huge decrease. So where I think on the date of the law's passage, there were about, I think it was about 84, 85 kids in the facility, maybe a little bit higher. Uh, last week, or actually as of 13th of March, and I'll talk about another slide, 
uh, there were 11. And those are pretrial detained kids. You'll see that this number hasn't gone down a little further because now the juvenile justice agency has taken upon themselves to screw things up a little bit. And I'll explain that. Um, but we've seen a huge decrease over time uh, as a result of the uh, new detention law. My favorite thing about this is that actually if you zoom in here, you can see that there are a couple other spikes that pop up. Corresponding to each of those spikes have been Court of Appeals opinions, reversing judges, saying, no, you actually have to pay attention to this new law. And then you see decreases that correspond uh, after those Court of Appeal opinions, which I just love how you can actually see in the data what's happening uh, in real life. So what's going on now? The new kind of front that we're having to fight is, so I was talking about how the numbers of pretrial detained kids have decreased pretty substantially and have gone down even further than what we show here. Unfortunately, what's happening is now that there's space, the agency is filling it with their own kids, post-trial kids, that were never there in the first place. And for years, the agency who manages the facility complained that the court was detaining too many kids who weren't a safety risk. They were detaining kids because they were frustrated with them or they were upset with them. And now that there's space in the facility, the agency is doing the exact same thing. Oh, now we have room. So now we're going to detain the kids that we're frustrated with. And so this is going to be one of the new battles that we have to face now. As you get into your careers and you start working, you'll find out that a lot of this policy work and a lot of the advocacy work is unfortunately like playing whack-a-mole knock one problem down and another one pops up in its place. And so you spend a lot of time pushing on different levers, trying to create a kind of cohesive theory of change and to push. In DC, one of our biggest problems is we have what's called an edifice complex. We love our buildings. We build new buildings, we put ribbons on them, politicians cut ribbons and everyone smiles. When it gets to the hard work of actually providing the community-based supports and resources and investing directly in families and in young people, that harder work is where the struggle is and where the city has fallen most frequently and fallen most direly. That is where the city should be focusing its attention and focusing its resources, and yet it comes back to focusing on buildings. So as of February 27th, I'm going to use this snapshot because this was the lowest I had ever seen it in my career. On that date, we had nine detained youth, seven male detained, one, uh, woman, one young woman detained, and then one detained committed youth. So we went from on... January 29th of 2017, so this was three months before this new law took effect, we had 111 pre-trial kids. So not included in committed youth who were at the facility. 111 pre-trial kids at the facility. And on February 27, 2019, just over two years later, we had none. A decrease of 92% over two years by making some simple changes to the detention standard that are forcing judges and forcing the system to rethink whether detention is actually necessary. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I had a PO come up and talk to me one day in court and she told me, you know all the POs are talking behind you behind your back. And I said, is that a good thing? She's like, no, it's a very bad thing. I was like, well, what are they saying? Like, well, they're talking about how you had some role to play in this law getting changed and how you know, it's not good that there are so many kids being released. And so I looked up the data. On Christmas Day, 2016, there were 71 kids in the facility. A year later, once the new law took effect, there were 28 kids in the facility. So 40 plus more kids were able to be home with their families that year. Right? 40 plus more kids were able to be connected to their community schools and stay in their community schools instead of being taken out and put into a facility that wasn't gonna do anything for them. The average stay at the facility prior to these changes 
was about 14 days. If anyone thinks 14 days in a facility is really doing anything but messing up whatever positive things that hit kid has going on in the community, they're wrong, right? It is a way to disrupt kids' lives rather than a way to promote rehabilitation. Uh, as of March 13th, we had 13 pre-trial kids. So the numbers are staying low. And the numbers are staying low in part because there has been no discernible impact on public safety. Arrests of young people in light of this new law continue to decline. There has been no increase in the number of monthly arrests of young people post the new law taking effect. And so detention, as we all knew from the research, doesn't make us safer. And what's actually happening in real life now is bearing that out. So what is next? What do we need to focus on here in the District of Columbia? The first thing we really need to focus on is making sure that we don't go backwards. And part of that is gonna mean taking a half-empty facility and figuring out how to repurpose that space to make sure no more shenanigans happen, right? How do we turn an 88-bed facility into what should be probably a 30-bed facility and use that remaining space for productive activities, independent living for young people, mental health supports for young people, academic supports for young people, rather than having it be places where kids are hidden away from society, not receiving any of the rehabilitative services that we promised. And then the other part is really the hard work of the community-based work. So what does work, right? The young people who come into the system have suffered a significant amount of trauma. We know trauma has an impact on functioning, right? They've been through a lot. They have needs, they have wants, they have goals. So how do we get them to where they wanna be? What the research shows is the trick is really to provide intervention to risk. So most of the kids who come into the system are actually low risk kids. And the more you intervene with them, the more likely you make it that they're gonna turn into medium or high risk kids. So the first trick, the first thing we need to realize is that our founding principle should be the one of the medical profession, do no harm, right? Let's not screw this kid up more. Let's not screw this kid up at all which is often what the system does. So we need to match intervention to risk. We also need to match interventions to needs. So what is it that this young person actually needs? And then we need to provide actual therapeutic services rather than control services. So if you wanna think about it in a kind of a, a summary, it's the goal is to provide the right services to the right kid at the right dosage. And that work of community-based interventions is the hard work that we really should be focusing on here in DC over the next five, 10, 15 years. So I think we're gonna be opening it up for questions now um, from folks, uh, and so let us know. We'll give you the mic. Great question. So the question is, there was a uh, statistic earlier about the percentage of LGBTQ youth in the facilities who uh, experience abuse. And the question was, specific to DC, are there a high percentage of LGBTQ youth in the facility and what's being done about that? The unfortunate reality is that historically, uh, very few systems, including DC, have kept data on the percentage of LGB LGBTQ um, kids in the system itself. The rationale that systems give is uh, that collecting that type of data is difficult. They don't necessarily wanna have those conversations with kids. They don't feel like they should be having those conversations with kids. And so they've kind of turned the other direction and ignored uh, the data keeping aspect of it. What we know from studies that have been done is that LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented 
in the juvenile justice system as well. Uh, and based on my experience, I would say that's true for DC as well. It often, um, especially a number of years ago, a lot of what you would see is kids ending up in the system due to family rejection. And so they were committing crimes on the street for survival. Um, they would have few places to go because families didn't want them home. Uh, and so they were more likely to end up in out of home placements as a result. So there has definitely been um, research and I'll say my own anecdotal experience confirmed that LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented in the juvenile justice system. And we have very few, I'll speak specifically about DC, very few interventions that are specifically tailored to LGBTQ youth. Um, this is part of actually a much larger problem uh, because the kids that are uh, uh, not uh, part of the binary system of, of sexuality uh, end up being pushed out of their houses very early in their lives. And they hit the streets and they become uh, thieves. Uh, they get uh, uh, picked up by pimps. Uh, they are targets of violence themselves. They are targets of the police themselves. Uh, one of the things that is a problem with prostitution among young people generally is when they get arrested, uh, they are not treated as victims. Uh, they are victims and uh, the law charges them with prostitution as opposed to saying, all right, this is a kid who wouldn't be here but for some other reason and we have to do some other intervention. Uh, there's a movement right now, Amnesty International is involved in this, a lot of people are involved in this, in trying to just decriminalize prostitution charges for young people because most of us know this is not a choice that they've made on their own. This is something that's sort of been forced into them. I'll say the other, the other kind of point that this brings to mind is historically the juvenile justice system <coughs> developed in a way that was very focused on hetero boys. And so services, approaches, philosophy has been very much geared around that population. And it really hasn't been, unfortunately now we're seeing a substantial, so the arrest decline that I showed you in the District of Columbia is actually driven entirely by a decrease in the arrests of boys. The arrests of young women in the District of Columbia has actually almost doubled during that same time period. And so we're seeing young women become an increasingly greater percentage of the juvenile justice system. And so systems are now starting to adjust to realize, oh, maybe we should have population specific programming and really individually tailor our services to the various types of, and really it should be individual, individually tailored to that actual individual youth because the goal is right services for the right kid at the right dosage. So much more individualization needs to happen. The whole issue of girls is also a relatively new problem as Eduardo says it. It used to be that girls would get arrested for running away from home or having sex with their boyfriends and things like that. Now there are a lot more fights, there are a lot more theft going on, there are girl gangs, and the system, as Eduardo says, is just not designed to take care of that problem. Other questions? So in DC, it, it really is how it's charged. So breaking the law is essentially a, what would be, it's defined as the equivalent of what would be a criminal offense if you were an adult. And status offense is designed, really targeted towards things that only kids can do. So in DC, it's really, def it's defined as truancy, habitual runaway, or uh, insubordination. Uh, or incorrigibility, I think is the term that's used. And so in DC, you will either get specifically charged with a what's called a PINS case, or you'll get charged in a delinquency case. And that sets up the bright line as to whether the detention standard applies or not. If you're charged in a delinquency standard, the detention standard applies. If you're just charged in a PINS case, now you can't be detained. The national problem is actually different though, because in a lot of places, uh, if a child has come in, comes in alleged to have committed a crime uh, and they, uh, the evidence is a little thin and they think they can't go in, they're not going to be able to make it. They can usually find some incorrigibility reason or some truancy reason to charge that child as a status offender. Uh, 
Status offenders are supposed to be deinstitutionalized by virtue of the federal law, but it's never been in, enforced very well. That, I'm not sure this is still the case, but there was also a provision in the, the statute for some times that if you violated a condition of your PIN status, that would become a crime. You could then be treated as a delinquent, so you'd be brought back into the delinquency side of the system. You know, adolescents are difficult people. <clears throat> They're not easy to deal with, and, and often, uh, I, I don't want to pick too much on parents, but parents are often uh, poor. They're not given the services that they need. Uh, they're used to dealing with government social agencies rather than high-priced psychiatrists to take care of a lot of these people, a lot of these problems, I mean. So uh, it, it, is, it is dramatically different state by state in how these things are being held. Also, if you're in a rural county, you know, you don't have a lot of arrests for anything. And so you're not going to build facilities that are separate for kids that are PINS kids, status offenders, and kids who are delinquents. And oftentimes there are none, and they end up in adult jail uh, in, the, in the town. Yeah, one of the things that Wally mentioned that uh, our attorney general here in DC is very progressive. Uh, he's also a former public of defender, uh, <laughs> which we try not to say too much publicly. Um, but so in DC, he has unilaterally just decreased the number of PINS cases that they, that they bring. There are virtually no truancy cases brought anymore in PINS court because of the recognition that court can do very little to actually help a kid who's not going to school because the school's not meeting its educational needs, uh, not uh, abiding by the individualized education plan, the IEP, not providing disability services, uh, et cetera, or school safety issues. And so he has done a great job of really reducing the number of kids that are coming on that side of, on that side of things. I thought I had him up over here somewhere. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So um, you showed us a chart of the rate of um, del um, children being detained, and that's been reduced. But I was just wondering um, what the recidivism rate looks like in comparison to that. So it's probably too early to know. Um, because the way recidivism rates are calculated is it's typically 12 to 18 months after the young people are done with the system. So if a young person who would fall into this cohort, let's say they were done about a year ago, we're still probably about six months out before we can actually calculate the recidivism rate with any certainty. The fact that arrests keep going down is a good sign to me because at least kids who are in that cohort aren't getting arrested on multiple things because they aren't being detained. Um, so that kind of early evidence I think is good. Um, this is one of the things that's, that seems to be hard or very sticky. In DC, our recidivism rate at least for, well actually I think for both pretrial or kids who go on probation or kids who are committed to the agency, tends to hover around 35%. And that's changed, it's been up as high as about 40 or 45. It hasn't been much lower. Uh, and so it seems like regardless of what we, tr we have tried in the past, that has been a pretty sticky number. So it'll be interesting in the next year or two to find out whether these changes help push that lower. I think, realistically, part of the reason for driving this change is what we're still missing and why this number has been so sticky to me is if you look at one of the studies while I talked about at the beginning is uh, a study called Pathways to Desistance. And it shows that for even the most serious offenders, about 80% by the time they're about 25 have stopped offending. And just kind of happens on their own, part, partly has to do with the fact that the prefrontal cortex of the brain is fully developed at that time, adolescence is kind of winding down, people are settling into adult responsibilities and so desistance happens. So a lot of desistance happens naturally. The fact that it's at 30, 35% to me shows we're screwing some of that up or we're just not calculating recidivism at a long enough kind of time frame to capture normal adolescent development. Um, but I think the other big piece of it is we're just not investing in kids and families correctly. So when kids come back from facilities, they'll have been gone for nine months and if there was a problem in the home, no one bothered to do anything to address that problem in the home while they were gone. 
or if there was a problem in the community or a problem at their school. No one's actually worked on any of that while they were gone. The expectation is, kid, go away, fix yourself, come back, and no matter what obstacles you faced before that are all going to exist when you get back, things are going to be different. And then they come back, and nothing's changed. Um, and so we're asking the kids to do a bunch of work, and we're not actually doing the community-based work that we need to be doing that I think would drive those numbers down. But, but keep in mind there, is, there will always be recidivism. There will probably always be crime. Need, greed, and entertainment, the three most important reasons to commit crime. But what we're trying to do is show the courts that most of those people who are dragged into the system are not the group that's going to be recidivist. So if your system is set up to bring in the bulk of people, then you're going to be bringing in more people than the ones you should be targeting on who will have a high likelihood of recidivism and not wreck the other group by just putting them in contact with dangerous situations. And that's the other thing that Racine here has done well, is the number of diversions have gone up pretty substantially. And he's kicking a lot more cases out of the system before they get formally processed in hopes that we're really focusing more on the young people who need the interventions rather than the young people who, if we just leave them alone, we'll never see them again. You know, and just, we'll get to your question in a second, but one of the things you have to understand is that children, adolescent children, do what their friends do. And so they don't even understand sometimes what is a crime. If you're standing with somebody who is committing a crime, you think you're totally innocent. But if you do any little thing that would encourage that person to commit the crime, you're just as guilty as the person who does it. And so if both of them come in as a robbery, or if both of them come in as drug dealers because somebody comes up to me and says, where can I buy some drugs? And I point at a dealer on the corner, which would get me arrested as well. You know, why is that anything other than a recognition that adolescents will do things that their friends are doing that might contradict what their own brain is saying, I really shouldn't be doing this? Uh, there were a couple of questions on this side. Yes, in the back. Both of you. The question is, what are ways that the rehabilitation aspect of the juvenile justice system could be improved? So I think it comes down to this, right? It, it's, we tend to think of, or at least I could tell you, I could close my eyes and walk into a courtroom and tell you what all the conditions are going to be offered or put on a kid. They're going to have a curfew. They're going to be told to go to school every day. They're going to be told to visit their PO. They're going to be told to comply with some type of mental health services that the PO puts in place. And they're going to be told to do community service. And that happens for every kid in every case. And for kids put on probation, all of them get 90 hours of community service, regardless of whether that is actually something tailored towards rehabilitation. So I think improving rehabilitation involves three things. One, it involves recognizing the kids that we don't need to do anything with and making sure that they don't spend much time in the system. Two, I think it means connecting young people to services that they both want and are good outside the system that are tailored to their needs. Because the reality of the system itself, as I call this the central fallacy of the juvenile justice system, is that it believes that, let's say, a 16-year-old comes in, right? And we know that they've suffered a ton of trauma. And the average kid probably spends somewhere between six to nine months in the juvenile justice system. So in six to nine months in the juvenile justice system, we're going to provide them with services that are going to somehow address everything that's happened in the first 16 years of their life. And then when they seem to be doing well, we are going to rip all those services away and send them on their way, right? It, it does not have a recognition of the fact that a lot of this needs to be done in coordination with other services, in coordination with other agencies and other institutions, and really in coordination with the young person's family and community, because that's what's going to have the biggest impact long term. Um, going off of all of that, I'm interested in forensic psychology, and so I was wondering where you think that plays a role that kind of diverges from adult forensic psychology, because from what I've kind of um, found out for myself, it's more like insanity and like 
to witness eyewitness testimony and, and whether or not that's verifiable within court and kind of all that. But, you know, with a kid who's, you know, 14, 15, or 16, I don't really know if, like, insanity really counts. So how can forensic psychology be more tailored to kids and what role, like, does it play in, in the courts as opposed to pretrial or sentencing or rehabilitation? I didn't hear the whole question. Uh, so the question is about what role does what role should forensic psychology play in juvenile court? You know that's a, that's actually an interesting question, and it has to do with how much you believe in forensic psychology in the first place. You know, um, the earlier question was how can we improve the system. One of the things I would say is leave kids alone. Just leave them alone and let them make mistakes and be adolescent. To over pathologize the behaviors that children have and send them all to psychologists, I think is a mistake. Uh, the juvenile court was created because we thought it was gonna help people and we sent them to this institution and it turned out ultimately like most institutions, it tends to serve itself rather than the people that are coming in. This is not to say that psychologists and psychiatrists are, uh, haven't a role to play, but I think we all need to have a little humility about what we can at actually accomplish and what we actually uh, need to accomplish with a certain group. As I said, you know, I grew up in kind of a tough town and, and you know, a lot of us did things that could have, could have or did bring us into the court system and we all got through it. And uh, that's the best answer I could give to your question. It's a recognition of the skills that, that psychologists, forensic psychologists have and to use them appropriately and not use them every chance you get, because most kids really probably don't need them. But we may disagree on no, this. I, don't I, I, would, I would echo that with Wally. I do think, I think there is a role for forensic psychology to play. I would echo, though, that it is a much smaller role than it currently plays. And I would also add that if you're going to go that route, which I think is very valuable, to do it well. So a lot of what we see now with forensic psychology in the system is it's very different than the forensic psychology you would get if you, have, if you were a paid client. And so best practices are you interview multiple people, you collect all the records you can, you do this very deep analysis of this young person who's sitting before you. In the system, virtually all of our clients are diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, which to me sounds like adolescence. Um, and there's this over pathologizing of young people that happens in the system. And I actually think the forensic psychologists could be on the forefront of pushing back against that, of recognizing this isn't ODD, this is adolescence, or this is PTSD, or this is a young person for whom everyone just needs to get out of his way or her way and let them succeed on their own. And I think as a gatekeeper function, a forensic pathologist, or sorry, a forensic psychologist could play that important role of making sure that the system doesn't overreach. And I think we, I, I know you want to close this on, but I think we've already seen the help that we can get from it. The analysis of trauma is, is nobody talked about trauma in the juvenile court even three years ago. The notion of adolescent development and, and how kids what motivates kids differently from adults. That all came from forensic psychologists as well. And that is what's behind a lot of the changes that are taking place in the District of Columbia. We live in a fortunate place. There's a lot of forensic psychologists and a lot of lawyers here. And so we can do things once we get uh, the desire to do those things. We can get them done. And Eduardo's been, I think, in the forefront of getting that done. So thank you very much. It's been fun. Thank I wish all. we had more time.